Good morning, everyone. I'm welcoming you all to the inauguration of the Institute for Advanced Membrane Technology. Today, 29th of June, today was the day where our nanofiltration conference, the second attempt was to start, and we were going to visit our labs here um, in the beginning. So we are opening the Institute instead. We're still showing you the Institute in a very innovative um, virtual tour, showing some posters, some research, and giving an overview. Now, first of all, of course, great that you're all there. You see the numbers are still climbing in the registrations. And move my slide, that would help. Oh, here we are. So we advertised um, a bit more than a week ago on Sunday. And yesterday we had 350 registrations. This morning it was just under 400. We have registrations from around the world and a very big balance between academics, PhD students, industry, and others. So in other words, we are very, very overwhelmed and humbled by the interest in the opening of the Institute for Advanced Membrane Technology. And we also, if you have seen in the program, we have amazing speakers today, a wonderful program. And essentially everyone I asked except for one accepted to speak. So thank you in advance to all the speakers. It's a great honor to have you all here and um, speak about this global water issue and membranes. Now the one person I invited who couldn't make it was Mini Elmelech and he's on holidays, which is very unusual for him, but um, I allowed him to go. So, um, why opening this institute now? Well, firstly, as I said, we had the conference. Um, this institute was um, started early last year in January, and then soon after Corona came. Um, we have a book that is appearing today as the electronic version. And so we are launching this book at the same time, which was also going to be launched at the conference, but we now didn't want to wait a year for that to happen. And we have quite a number of collaborative international projects that are waiting for a kickoff and we just simply can't travel. So we're combining all this together. Um, there's a little bit of um, waving farewell to Corona as we have known it for the last one and a half years. So we are all hoping that life will come to a little bit more natural um, or normal state where we can see each other and have some in-person discussions and visits. Now, to start with the um, Institute for Advanced Membrane Technology, I'm going to give you an overview shortly about how that started. But in essence, I was invited to apply for a fellowship in Germany in late 2011. We wrote it over Christmas and New Year. We were successful in February, and that guaranteed quite a sum of money for the rest of my career. Then started a long recruitment process to KIT, and one of the deciding factors was actually that my husband as a dual career could also get a position. And so eventually we then started in early 2014. And since then we've had quite a, a rocky road to get space, to get labs, to get people. And so as of Last year, we have the Institute for Advanced Membrane Technology that was opened, and this is what we're really celebrating and opening today. So to come to our program, well, we have firstly the welcome and the overview about this institute um, by myself, and then we're going on to the speakers. Um, Janet Herring from AirVac is going to be our first one. Then we're going to have nanofiltration book launch. Um, later this afternoon, a virtual lab tour, then poster presentations by our team, and then later the close and the um, invitation to the nanofiltration conference. Now, what um, I would like to note, it's in a virtual, it's an online meeting. We haven't done this before, certainly not with this number of people. We have a great team here who will hopefully help everyone who has trouble getting in or having technical issues be allowed for time. We have 15, 20 minute presentations. We allowed for half an hour to deal with these technical issues if there is any. Um, if there isn't, we have time to discuss. What you probably notice, um, normally I feed my guests very well with drinks, with food, 
there is not even a break in the schedule today. And we just simply gathered that if you would like some coffee, you can get up and get one wherever you get it from. And um, so there isn't breaks. There is the uh, um, virtual lab tour that um, can also be looked at online later. So hopefully everyone will get what they need during the day to stay with us. And with that, I will start with the overview of the Institute for Advanced Membrane Technology that was founded through the university procedures on 1st of January 2020. Um, I'm going to show you our strategy of what kind of research we do, how we organize that, um, then some project examples, and then some other innovations, I may say, that we do on research skills training. So the Cultural Institute of Technology is not that old. It was founded in 2009, and it was founded by the merger of the University of Karlsruhe, which was originally founded in 1825, one of the big technical universities of Germany, and the Research Center Karlsruhe that by the time I was a student was known as the Nuclear Research Center. Um, the largest research center in Germany, and there is nuclear reactors on campus, now turned into a museum, but that was founded in 1956. 1995, that turned into a national laboratory for technology and environment. And these two were merged in 2009 as what is probably recognized as a very, very big experiment in Germany to merge a national research center with a state-funded, owned university. And that's now one big institution with all its opportunities and challenges. And it has three main tasks, and that is research, education, and innovation. Very curiously, I was told some rumors when I came here, and that was that the MIT was funded, founded based on KIT. And so I looked into this in the archives and library. And indeed, William Rogers, who's the founder of the MIT, wrote in 1864 that the Polytechnic Institute at Karlsruhe, regarded as the model school of Germany, perhaps of Europe, is nearer what is intended that the MIT shall be any of our foreign institution. Every part of the establishment is designed for use and not for show. So he wrote this after he toured Europe and looked at a few institutions. So I thought that was quite curious. Um, where are we? We are in South Germany and Karlsruhe more or less the center of Europe. Um, we have a number of campuses. Firstly, the Campus South, which is the former, or still the university near the castle in Karlsruhe. We have the Campus North, which is the research center where we are right now. And we also have a Campus Alpin, where often I say I'd rather work there, um, just under the Zugspitze in Garmisch Pattenkirchen. It's, KIT is the largest of 18 Helmholtz centers. And it is the research university in the Helmholtz Association. There is eight or 9,000 staff here, so it's quite a large institution. And of course, with a lot of infrastructure and opportunities. Now, to me personally, to give a little bit of background for those attendees who don't know me, well, I came, well, I am German, but I traveled for 20 years abroad. I did a master's in France in process engineering, a PhD at UNSW in Australia, then this funding for culture came through as I was in Edinburgh and had planned a sabbatical in Tanzania. So we decided to go to Tanzania, possibly shortening that. In the end, we extended this time in Tanzania because it took so long to get this recruitment to Germany work out. And in the end, we needed every day of experiments there where we did some um, decentralized water treatment for 18 months. So the Helmholtz Recruitment Initiative grant is 600,000 euros per year permanent. And with that, we started the Membrane Technology Department at the Institute for Functional Interfaces in 2014. Now, my motivation to come to KIT is to actually expand for my civil and environmental engineering background back more to process engineering and harvest the materials capabilities of KIT. So always water treatment, but now I was driven by a very, very strong frustration at the time that we were applying membranes <laughs> and they presented themselves to us pretty much as black boxes. We didn't know the properties, we didn't make them, 
course, we couldn't control it and we couldn't even really understand our results because we didn't know the actual chemical characteristics or even the, the shape and the structure. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if we could make membranes and control the properties to then um, achieve our goals in a much more um, coordinated or planned way? I've tried several times over the years to get ERCs and once again failed at the last stage. So this time there was an ERC recognition award of 200,000 for um, near miss failures. And with that, we have been able to do some more work in this area and develop this further. Now, important here is really my vision, and that is I have a dream, safe water for all children, which was really born when I became a professor in Edinburgh five years after PhD. I didn't know what to do with myself anymore, having achieved this long-term goal so quickly. And then I reflected on some time in Africa, hitching on the back of a truck and promising to some locals that once we are engineers, we would come back and help. And so we remembered this. We knew, or I knew that 4,000 kids at that time were dying each day due to lack of safe water. And then I thought, well, if I want to retire with some kind of satisfaction of having done something useful, then it's probably doing something about this problem. And so this is where this vision came from. I have a dream, safe water for all children. And we're going to do this with the expertise of membrane materials and processes. So what do we do at IMT? We have essentially three main pillars. The first one is novel membrane materials. This has been added at KIT, where we are, through collaborations, through some of our own modifications, codings, and even sometimes making membranes, working on nanocomposite membranes, membrane adsorbers, photocatalytic membranes, quite new electrochemical membranes, and some biomimetic membranes or biocatalytic membranes. We do what we've always done. Let's look at membrane transport mechanisms, looking how organic and inorganics get through membranes, how they transport, how they interact. Strong focus on micropollutant removal, as always, steroid hormones. Solute solute interactions in environmental matrices. We're looking at real waters. How do they change the transport or the material surfaces? And of course, being membranes fouling. So how to identify that, how to control that. Then we're looking at processes. A very long standing topic of ours is the renewable energy membrane systems, hybrid membrane processes, and desalination and water reuse. And then gray. Out is the modeling. I'm not a modeler, and I've always with real waters, I have my hesitations what we can model that's so complex. But here we're collaborating, and we have some nice systems now where we feel we can do some modeling. Now, all this work is funded from Helmholtz, so most of it is built for third party funding, where we work in the Earth and Environment Program, collaboration with Leipzig and Jülich. And we also have synergies with the programs of energy and information that used to be the materials work. Now, the approach, of course, is from nano to macro. So we want to know how a molecule or an ion transports through a tiny pore. Nanofiltration is a nanometer or less. And we also want to make processes to harvest these materials. Now, the global challenges. Well, we have water issues. That's why children die. So first of all, people die because of microorganisms. Microorganisms, you see here a little COVID. Um, viruses, bacteria, they're in the water, and if our immune system gets too much of them or can't um, deal with it, then people get ill and die. We don't look at microorganisms in our processes simply because with membranes, they are retained anyhow, and we usually design processes to have a dual barrier often. Yeah? We then deal with salts, desalination, removing arsenic, fluoride, uranium, nitrate, so things that are very small and very difficult to remove from water, they need advanced treatment. We don't do a lot on seawater desalination because we think it's a little energy intense. Then we work on macromolecules, humic substances, they cause disinfection byproducts, they cause fouling, they are con uh, contribute to the transport of contaminants, and they look Dark. So in that sense, we can remove these. And ultimately, we look at micropollutants, where, for example, 
example, pharmaceuticals, steroid hormones, they get into the water cycle and are not removed normally to great extent or completely by traditional water. Okay, now if we look at our approach, well, it, the idea some years back when everyone was talking about digital twins, we were looking at how can you do a digital twin in membranes? And so there, the idea came up, well, if we had a membrane plant, and we could design a material and then actually have a system where we can simulate this material and see how the process performance would be like before we do all this tedious experiments in the lab, upscaling, making these membranes full scale, I think we could use, uh, save quite a lot of effort. And that is the idea. Of course, it's a very ambitious goal. I have um, scoped the work that we work on nanofiltration and ultrafiltration. We don't work on microfiltration normally because it doesn't remove sufficient pathogens. And we try to avoid reverse osmosis because it requires too much energy. And so we're in this ultra nanofiltration range, both have nanometer scale pores. And this is really where we are now working with different materials to understand, to create processes that are more specific in removal of contaminants and more effective in terms of energy and water production. Here are some of our approach. So on the top, experimentally, we have process and module at the large scale. We have then the pore structure, the structure performance relationships. And then we have what we may call pore reactions. That may be adsorption, that may be photocatalysis, that may be electrochemical interactions. So that is where we're working. And then on the other hand, we have the models where we have CFD that's established. We have some kind of morphology, um, navier Stokes extensions. And then we're getting in this range of say, nanometers where we're not quite sure. In fact, we know that the continuum relationships are no longer valid and we don't really know yet what to do with that. So that's a very, very exciting topic. And I hope that Guy Ramon later will speak um, in detail about this. And then, of course, there's molecular dynamics. So these kind of things we're very interested in. I think we can speak with people in that area to create models. But of course, we can't do that by ourselves. You see later this afternoon quite a few talks on micro and nanofluidics. And I like this topic very much because it really stretches everything that I thought I knew. Now we have about nine examples of projects with some, be warned, very, very overloaded slides. Um, it's not about communicating the sides, it's about giving you a taste of what we do. And here I would emphasize that we have later today also poster presentations from the team. So micropollutant removal, we are looking at hormones that go in the wastewater. We are trying to achieve these guidelines that have been set at one nanogram per liter. And that's of course an analytical challenge which we need to solve. So there we have developed liquid scintillation tools that also can separate, and we have a state-of-the-art LTMSMS that we're also setting up to achieve these roles. Some examples here, we've worked with adsorbers in membranes, and with some of these adsorbers, very thin layers, we can achieve this guideline, starting with about 100 nanograms per liter, getting to one. So this is really quite amazing, and that is a ultrafiltration process combined with adsorption. We are very exciting. Then we have worked for the last 20 years on breakthrough in nanofiltration, which I figured out with Long Neem back at UNSW, early 2000, that we could actually see breakthrough of steroid hormones through nanofiltration. I was shocked at the time as I was teaching uh, membranes and absorption, ion exchange, and all I said, there is no breakthrough in nanofiltration, there's always separation. Well, that proved myself wrong. But there we're still trying to find out mechanisms um, differentiation between convection, diffusion, and seeing if we can create systems, micro, macro, dead end stirred cells, where we can have new materials that are often only available very, very small scale, where we can characterize these in terms of breakthrough. And of course, for that, we need to know is that system dependent, is that um, hydrodynamics dependent, concentration polarization, what really determines this breakthrough. And there are here some examples where. Yes, it is dependent very much on mostly concentration polarization, but it emphasized again that we need very well-defined systems, and I think that's something which we have done well here. A very complicated, one of our most exciting projects is 
Roman, Lubin and Menko. Roman is using photosensitizers with some porphyrin-coated membranes. When he filters methylene blue, I'm particularly happy because then the membranes turn purple. And what he does, he has an organic photosensitizer that acts as a photocatalyst on the membrane. And in very few um, seconds, in situ, by filtering through this membrane, that's actually a microfiltration membrane that's coated, we can remove these contaminants. It's a full slide on the bottom right, but we can get almost um, to the guideline value. I think we're currently at about five nanograms or so that we can achieve. So very exciting. Very similar project here on the um, collaboration with IOM in Leipzig, where we have um, previous work, I have to say, was collaboration with IMT, Andrew Bushatov and Bryce Richards. And Roman did a really nice job developing a scintillation counter method where he can separate the hormones so we can do mixtures and we can see degradation. Right, then Shabnam is working on similar methodology, but different membrane, TiO2 in a polymer, and she can equally get in this very little flow through time down to close to one nanograms per liter. And I think last I see was two or three. So very, very exciting results. Um, this is what we do in materials. There's a lot more, of course, in the press than for the last few 20 years, we have worked on systems. So coupling renewable energy with membranes. It's an interdisciplinary um, large scale project where we have energy, Bryce Richards involved. We are looking at water transport, modeling, speciation. And we're working a bit with communities to look at technology adaptation and uptake. And of course, always the principles. This was the focus of 18 months in Tanzania where we have published extensively on this topic. The highlight of that was a field work in Darren and Yuki and Midori, two sites, very high fluoride, 50 milligrams per liter, very high organic matter, I think it was above 100. And what we could do there really is remove those two together in, uh, without any kind of infrastructure, so just with renewable energy and membranes. Then we're working on metal organic matter complexation. So because we want to understand what's going on, we need to know if organic matter and the contaminants work together, uh, interact. Here, um, we're setting up a very, very complicated analytical device, low field flow fractionation coupled to ICBMS, alternatively coupled to LC-OCD. And we're currently looking at a particle size also to couple to this um, machine. And the point there is to see can, will these contaminants interact and will this influence our removal of arsenic or strontium so ions in solution? And that's looking very positive, but of course, analytically extremely challenging. Um, another project in this renewable energy or development work is arsenic removal, where Yusuf um, is looking or the team is looking at um, arsenic in nanofiltration, and particularly the question, what happens if you get climate change? Seawater intrusion, sea level uh, rises, there's more salt in the water, and with rising temperatures, there's more organics. Will that affect the effectiveness of membranes? I think for salt, we have a good resilience, we may say, and with organic matter, we're actually getting more removal because there's more interaction. So this is currently our state of knowledge, again, using this huge amount of instruments to measure and analyze. Last example, and probably most exciting, because yesterday we got a, a single pass ED delivered. So Maren, who's sitting here, is of course very excited, wanting to start with that. Um, this is something where we have worked for 20 years with solar powered um, or wind powered nanofiltration, ultrafiltration. Um, we're now using this for electrodialysis, and we now have a system that can really actually do this in single pass. So uh, again, removal of fluoride, um, selenium, arsenic, nitrate. So that was our taste of research of what we do. Then I wanted to communicate briefly, sorry, with the wrong heading, um, our research skills training. And while setting up from nothing, no space, no people, um, I got a bit frustrated. And I really felt there was the need for enhanced skills in such a scientific writing. So sometimes we get people who are brilliant in setting up labs, but just refuse to write, maybe because they don't feel they can learn that. Um, 
PhD students especially, but postdocs also really having a big taboo about budgeting. What do things cost? What do I know what to ask for? Generally, leadership, supervision, um, and also self-management. So when our conference was canceled last year and postponed, I said, hey, we have a week. Um, we managed to get space. So we managed to go away for a week and do this in our team days. Direction and focus. We did um, archery. We did climbing. We made bread in a wood-fired oven. We did look at some of our beautiful region. And we had 13 lectures on different topics from writing inspired by white sites in Harvard and really through to project management, budgeting, who am I, what is leadership? And this year we have the second version of that. We're currently looking at what kind of topics we're going to cover. Um, and then because we overloaded the program and we didn't have time for the exercises, it turned out that we we're going to start a career club following to do the exercises. So keep this topic alive. And I think that's quite innovative and hope will get us some better graduate PhD skills. We have positions here. We always look for really good people who have these skills already, ideally. So we have group leader, postdoc, scientists. We can always hire with a scheme here that's very similar to Humboldt um, that we can award directly. And then, of course, PhD and master's positions. So there we have a link. And those who know me, I'm always very, very keen to collaborate and have fun and exchange ideas and skills. So very welcome for that. Acknowledgements, well, we have Helmholtz funding mostly, but of course also BMBF or DFG funding. We've had many previous teams that helped build that both the research, but also our institute, and then a lot of international collaborators and industry partners. So thank you for all of that. Bottom right, you also see a crazy family who has to tolerate all these adventures and struggles. So with that, thank you very much. So, team, I think we need to handle questions that can come either in the chat or by unmuting microphones for those who can, raising hands. Okay. Hello? Uh, Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Celine? Hello. Uh, so, I'm Celine Jacquin from IAVAC. And I have a question um, um, for your nano, carbon nanotube filters with UF membranes, I think. Um, have you ever tried to monitor the carbon nanotubes in the permeate of, the, of these membranes? Because I, I think it's, it's one of the problem of this technique is that we are not sure um, if the membrane really retains the carbon nanotubes. Okay, um, we didn't look at it. We thought about doing it and have the technique that could potentially do that, although we, were, we weren't confident that the calibration was working, so we didn't purchase the machine. Um, no, what we have done is we have avoided the problem in that we put an ultrafiltration membrane underneath the membrane that holds the carbon nanotube. Okay. So, so long as that membrane is has integrity, there will be no issue. But I totally agree with you with the issue, and I really don't think it's a sustainable approach because long-term, if you have integrity issues, you're gonna end up with nanoparticles in the, in the permeate. I think that's a, that's a no-brainer. So what, when you look at our work, we have the polymer-based activated carbon that outperforms, I think, the carbon nanotubes. Mm -hmm. And these particles are 200 micrometer, half a millimeter big. Okay, and just, just for curiosity, what, what is the instrument you would use for monitoring the carbon nanotubes in the permate? We have looked at um, LIBD. Now this is laser-induced. <laughs> La laser-induced breakdown detection. Thank you, Pia. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Great. But yes, I had my queries about it. We looked into it quite thoroughly. There is a PhD in France that had tried to do this with carbon nanotubes, but we were not convinced in the end. Okay, thank you. Now I've got a second name here, which is Tapasti Sarkar. Is that also a question? Okay, one one last question, then we move on. So Babak Menofa, this name here is okay. How does Babak get to speak? Yeah, thank you very much for your very nice talk. 
concerning to the using of the pore frame, um, is there any uh, difference between the functional groups they are on top of the pore frame or not to absorb them? To absorb them to the membrane? Yeah, when, when you are doing this process with UV, uh, first of all, they should be absorbed on the surface of this uh, pore frame and depend on the functional groups they have on the end of the pore frame, they can be different, of course, you know, because of the metal they are inside the pore frame too. Did you see any changes for that? Yeah, this is a really, really good question. We don't have the results here because we are trying to publish it at the moment. Okay, but this afternoon there is there's Roman presenting a poster, so you ask him. Now, in a quick summary, the, uh, assuming that the membrane is being quite hydrophobic, that their porphyrin is absorbing quite nicely to the PVDF membranes. Okay, and then, yes, we have looked at different metals and looked at their performance photocatalytically, and Roman has some really interesting results there, which I will not now preempt, but there is differences indeed, and then Toshitov, Roman, Bryce Richards are really looking at the um, different porphyrins for this reason.